Okay, we are in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, and uh, Paul has stopped talking about the personal issue uh, of where he's pleading for unity between, well he's talking about unity for the whole church, talking about being uh, like-minded, uh, and that like-minded is the ideal of being of the same mind as Christ, that they all are thinking on the Word of God, or they're heavenly-minded, uh, their citizenship is in heaven, they're not worldly-minded. He gave us the illustration in chapter 3, verse 19, people that are worldly-minded, it says their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, because their mind is on earthly things. So he wants us to be, or the Philippians, to be like-minded, and that's going to lead to unity. By drifting away and becoming worldly-minded, they're going to start going different directions. There's going to be disunity. And last week we talked about, for example, uh, in verse 2 and 3, talking about the two women that were had some kind of a disagreement. They were probably leaders in the church. Uh, they weren't just, you know, in the basement making potato salad. They were probably had maybe churches in their homes that were meeting and they were divided on something. Probably not a doctrinal issue, because if it was doctrinal, Paul would have addressed it and chose sides and said, this is what's right, these people are in error. Probably something they could have gotten over, but there, he mentions it in the letter, and so there must have been something uh, that everyone knew about. It wasn't just a private issue, something that was affecting the whole church. He mentions uh, Clement and his fellow worker, uh, his fellow yoke, uh, yoke, uh, yokeman that's working with him, uh, our loyal yoke fellow, that loyal yoke fellow, could be uh, Timothy, another good guess would be Luke, who's worked in this area. Uh, he goes un unmentioned here, but then Clement is mentioned along with all the rest of his fellow workers. So this Euodia and Syntyche were workers with Paul. At some level they were assisting him in his ministry there in Philippi. And he wants them to come back on the same page, be like-minded, and bring others with him. Now, in beginning in verse 4, we're going to get 4 through 7. I'll try and read real quickly down through 4 through 9, and then we'll come back and talk about it. He now begins to address the church as far as uh, imperatives, telling them how to live. This is basically, uh, it has to do with the, the believer's life. Um, it's going to be imperatives, so they are, in a sense, commands. And these commands are not so much uh, to be bossy, but it's ideal of words like this are going to be, it's going to guard them, it's going to protect them, it's going to strengthen them, it's going to keep them in the peace of God. Uh, these are things that are going to take place with, with these verses. So this again is instruction or encouragement for the church as a whole. I'll begin in verse 4 of chapter 4. So we're kind of switching directions, building on what he's written already. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And so, those are his imperatives as he moves into this next section. Uh, one thing is, is, is very important in this, and it, as we're going to see it several times, is the mind, is the thought, is, is what you are thinking, what you have in your mind has to be knowledge. It's something about that what you, what you know. If you can know these things, it's going to give you peace. It's going to give you faith. It's going to give you the ability to pray. Now, this is not Gnosticism. This is not like some Gnosticism is that idea of you got secret knowledge and you're going to attain this knowledge. This is the, basically, this comes down to this thing right here, the Word. It's going to be the truth. It's going to be reality. It's going to be God's revelation. God's, and we see this throughout our culture of, of having lost God's knowledge, God's Word. Not even, not even just Scripture, but basic things like uh, nations, borders, sexuality, marriage, family. A basic, you don't even need to be a Christian to understand 
you need to have nations, you need to have borders, you need to have government, you need to have families, you need to have marriage, you need to have these things to stabilize your world. And it's like, and then we get into the Word of God. It's like, or even the existence of God. If you don't have these things, you're not going to have the knowledge in your mind or in your thoughts that's going to give you the faith that's going to lead you to pray, which is going to stabilize you in this world that is unraveling. And the Philippians find themselves in a world uh, that there is, in a sense, some persecution, some opposition that they're going to be facing. And that is kind of their situation. And if they get caught up in the world, we go right back to chapter 3, verse 19, where it says their, their mind is on earthly things. If your mind is on earthly things, the only thing left is uh, your destiny is destruction. Your God is going to be your stomach. What do you want? What are your desires leading you towards? And your glory, what you're going to prize yourself in or glory in, is going to actually be shame. It's actually going to be things in the kingdom of God. That's, it's, it's worthlessness. But then it goes on and says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus. And it goes on and gives us information. who will bring everything under his control. But that is now based on, he's giving us knowledge, something that we can know, have in our minds. And from that knowledge, that understanding, our mind is on heavenly things. We will have faith. We will have an understanding of God's plan, of God's future. And that will lead us to prayer. So that we're going to see here tonight that when we, when we face anxiety in this world, difficulties in this world, we see the difficulties, we have the problems, but we can go back to prayer and in faith tell God about what we're concerned about and that knowledge will give us strength and God will then stabilize us because we have the understanding of that God is going to hear our prayer. So there's several things coming up in here like that. And we're looking mainly in verse 8 when it says, finally brothers, I'm not going to go into those verses tonight. We'll do that next week. But between 4 and 7, the first thing he begins to say is rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So our, first of all, there's several things here. This rejoicing is going to be in the Lord. It's going to be, again, in the Lord. What does that mean? There's... It, in, in, in the Western world, we, we struggle with this because our culture's becoming more and more based on it, is subjectivity. How do you feel? Uh, how does the song move you? And it, it, this leads into Christianity, and our relationship with, with the Lord becomes an emotional thing. It becomes, how, does it, how do you feel? How, how, how is the Spirit leading you right now? If the Spirit's leading you or not, it, 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 it's mostly a matter of emotions. But this rejoice in the Lord, in the context, is not, well, we just go off into some mystical secret place and we find ourselves in the Lord and we just rejoice in this. Something, when I was in California and someone recently has sent me a video, they lived there and they, they saw it on the beach and so they sent it to me. But when I was on the beach this spring running, on, we were 20 hour out running and doing things on the beach, there was this group that they would go on the beach and, uh, you know, I don't want to, if you're involved in this and you think it's a great idea, I don't want to make fun of you. But they would go down there and they would just laugh. They would just laugh. They'd come down there and it was just, and they would just begin to laugh. And they get two or three of this laughing. It's like what they're trying to do, they're trying, you know, I don't know, I didn't research it, but it appears they're trying to just work up some kind of, you know, chemical in their being and get high on just laughter. I mean, you know, it changes your perspective. If you smile, if you're always frowning and grumpy, it has an effect on you. So they're, they're apparently going down there and just laughing and just working themselves into a state of, of happiness. And then they go back and they come back every day and they just laugh. Now, again, that's an example of not in the Lord. That's, that's an emotion. You're trying to work yourself into a frenzy. It's like getting fired up for the football game on Friday night. But it's, it, that's exciting, but it's not going to do you any good if you haven't practiced the plays, if you haven't ran the offense, if you haven't researched the other team. If you're just going to have the cheerleaders come out and jump up and down and get everybody fired up, the band's playing, and you're hitting each other's helmets together, yeah, then you run out on the field. It's like, what are we going to do now? Well, you're going to get destroyed because the other team actually has an offense. And so when it says here, in the Lord, this is not the modern, western, mystical, get excited at church. This is rejoice in the Lord, and what is in the Lord is right here. You have the world collapsing around you, putting pressure on you, 
but you also have this word right here in chapter 3, verse 20. But we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they'll be like his glorious body. That's not an emotional verse. That's facts. That's information. And so rejoice in the Lord. That's not meaning rejoice in some emotional thing. That's rejoice in this information. So, number one, this rejoicing is not in a world of rejoicing. Just be happy. And again, sometimes people get off on this too. You know, just have a positive attitude. Everything works out in the end. Well, for who? I mean, yes, it works out for God. It works out for believers. But if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're not in God's plan, it doesn't work out in the end for you. So, I mean, you can't just say rejoice and everything will work out because that's not true. If you're not in the Lord, if you don't have this understanding, you shouldn't be rejoicing. You should be repenting. You should be seeking something because this rejoice is going to be in the Lord, not in the world or not in some carnal situation. The next thing it says, rejoice in the Lord, it says always. Which again is, it doesn't mean uh, it, it's coming and going. It's not something that is just temporary or it's, it's unstable. Because the Lord is the Lord, because the word is always the truth, because God's plan is set, we know this truth, we rejoice in the Lord, but we can do it always. Now, your emotions come and go. I mean, sometimes you have a good day, sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes I have a good day until fifth period, and then it gets worse, and then I have a better day, sixth period, by the time the kids get there for seventh period, you know, and then it's like, whoa, you maybe have a good day. I, sometimes I have a great day at school until I walk from the building, and I walk past the bus line, and the kids are screwing around, and I've got to stop and make some corrections and take someone to the office. And it's like, well, I had a good day until I walked past the bus line. So sometimes, even how I exit the building, if I've got a good day going, it's like you look here, look there, and make sure you slip out so you don't have any conflicts on the way to your truck, and get home, and you say, had a good day. I avoided any kind of bus line. And so now, that's me on my emotional state. That's not what this is saying. I'm not rejoicing. <laughs> here because I had a good day. We have good days. We have bad days. We have good moments, bad moments. This say rejoice in the Lord. And that is basically information and what your understanding is. I don't think you can do this if you have no understanding of the Lord. You can't just rejoice in something you don't know. And again, it's always. Paul can't tell you always have a good day or always think positive thoughts, but he can tell you always rejoice in the Lord. And then he says again, uh, he says, I say it again, rejoice. So he's not, he's not missing this mark. He's telling you, rejoice in the Lord and do it always. I tell you again, rejoice. This is the key. But understand, if you erase in the Lord and you erase the stability of the fact you can always do the Lord and just say, always be happy, always rejoice, always smile, that's, that's a whole different thing. That's, that's, that's you trying to fake your way through life. Now, the things I wrote down on here, uh, uh, right here, the bullet points going underneath the chapter. And again, you can see I've got the verse written out at the top, at chapter 4, verse 4. I've got the Greek there. You can see the, the transliteration. You can see the Greek letters. And then you can see the translation that is used here. Underneath it tells you what part of the speech it is. Um, in this right here, I got the bullet points. It's the personal portion of in 4, chapter verse, chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 has closed, and Paul's now addressing the whole church. Paul begins to identify the life of the spiritual growing believer. And again, I'm saying this is the life of the person who is growing, who is maturing. They're in the Lord. Uh, number one is rejoice. And this will be followed by qualities of a person who is maturing Lord. We're going to get down to that on what you're going to do about these things. Um, but this church and Paul himself are facing difficulties, I put here. And these verses come to mind right here. Chapter 1, verse 28. Paul says to them, I just got it written out here in the book of Philippians. He says, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. So right here, there are those who oppose the Philippians. There are those who are opposing Paul. You can see the, the third bullet point under that's, the, you know, after chapter 1, verse 28, chapter 2, verse 15. Paul uses in reference to himself in chapter 1, verse 30, says, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now here I still have. So they're, they're going through the struggles, and they're being opposed going through struggles. And in this situation, they are to rejoice 
in the Lord, and they're to do it always because something bigger is happening here than what they see. And Paul even says that in verse 28. Now keep this in mind. He says, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but you will be saved. So he's talking about the world here. Now, I, I, I'm, going to make a, I'm going to make a move here. And when he says this next line, um, in verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. Now, I think we're safe to say right there, when he says all, he's referring to all people at all times, you know, believers and unbelievers, but possibly in context, because he's going to go back off into anxiety here, uh, and he's addressing, telling them to rejoice, is he may be talking about, specifically here about the world, and their gentleness. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And you can make a decision on this, it can refer to all people. I don't think he's just talking about the church, although he could be. I think he's talking about the world that is bringing this opposition, creating the struggles. How do we respond to them? Well, first of all, gentleness, the opposite of that would be retaliation. And the concept here is that our job is to be gentle. We'll talk about this word here. Is to be gentleness, uh, to be patient, to be gracious to the world. One, because that's God's nature towards them now. He's, bringing, he's giving them an opportunity. He's holding back wrath. But that's still our job. And our job is definitely not to bring judgment on the world. Uh, now, again, we're talking about Christians bringing judgment on unbelievers. We're not talking about those who are parents who are disciplining their children or government officials who are in charge of punishing criminals and, and bringing justice to the world or world leaders who are defending their country and having to take out the, you know, the, the, this is talking about Christians responding to a group of people. And in this case, I think it's the world. Of course, it could apply to all. But here we go. Uh, the, at the bottom of the page, chapter 4, verse 5, I got, let your... In the English standard, it says, Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. We'll talk about what that means here potentially in just a moment. But the first bullet point there, the word uh, that you can see it's translated, uh, it, it's, if you want to see the Greek, you can see the Greek right there. It's E P I E I K E S. And it can be translated gentleness, reasonableness, or another word is graciousness. Uh, and you can see where that comes from. It basically means fair-mindedness. It is a willingness to be charitable towards people's faults and failures because you take a person's whole situation into account before passing judgment. And the opposite would be retaliation. So he's telling them after saying rejoice, always rejoice, always in the Lord. He says now that you are rejoicing as you see, again, I'm, I'm going to build on this, because you see the big picture you see that even though the world may be opposing you, you're going through struggles, you see the big picture. You rejoice in the Lord, meaning these facts that have been revealed to us. We're going to do that always. And now your response to the world is going to be gentleness or fair-mindedness. You're not holding something against them, their faults or their failures, because you take into account the whole situation, meaning... You see the big picture, so you're rejoicing, but you look at the world, and they're coming against you. They're bringing opposition, and it's like, okay, Jesus did it on the cross. Stephen did it when they stoned him. Forgive them of their sins. They don't understand what they're doing. I mean, imagine the strength it takes of Jesus, and especially of Stephen being, you know, mere mortal, uh, to be able to be stoned to death and then pray, you know, don't hold this against them. They don't really understand. They don't see what I see. They don't have this in the Lord perspective. They can't rejoice. They can only oppose this. And that is what this word is meaning, is when you look at the world, again, I, I'm not talking about, you know, parents disciplining their children or government officials, you know, enforcing laws for a culture. I'm talking about the Christian who is being opposed by the world, looking at the world saying, you don't really understand. And what Paul is telling us to do is respond here to the world, to all people, with this, this non-retaliation. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, it says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. So this is Paul coming to the Corinthians. He wants to bring judgment to them, but because Christ wants him to continue to work, he comes to them with, with gentleness, and he says, I appeal to you, come back to your senses. Uh, Psalms 86, verse 5. 
has the, the re willingness to forgive. It says, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. So up until the very last moment, even, even on the day of judgment, Jesus Christ appears. It says, Those who call out on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that up until the very last moment, Jesus Christ, the Lord, is going to be good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. So our job is to be gentle to all. And then it says on the tails of that verse, it says, I'll read it right here off the notes, let your reasonable, reasonableness be known to everyone. In other words, you're not judgmental. You're not out trying to burn people, not trying to prove yourself right. But you're, you're, you're rejoicing in the Lord because you have an understanding and you're you're working, you're being gracious to others, knowing they don't understand that, but you're trying to bring them along. And then it says, the Lord is at hand. Now, when it says that, that's on page three, the Lord is at hand. It, it's the Lord is at hand. Or the Lord is near. This can be seen in two ways, and, and maybe both. One, let your gentleness, your graciousness, your non-retaliation attitude be known to all, be seen by all, be understood by all, because the Lord is at hand, the Lord is near. If you go with this idea right here, the Lord is near, meaning the Lord is with you, he's, he's in the same mode. He himself is being gracious to the world at this time. So you be gracious to the world. God is reaching out. He's, he's through us. is trying to bring salvation to the world. So the Lord is near. Presently in our lives, in the church age, he is near. So that would be that. Uh, you let your gentleness be evident to all, your graciousness evident to all, because the Lord himself is near doing the same thing. You are doing God's work. That's one way of seeing that. Or the Lord is at hand. This could come on that idea that it is not our job for retaliation because the Lord is at hand. Do your work. Be patient. Let them see the gentleness. You have an understanding. You take into account that they're, they're missing some pieces to the puzzle. So you're gentle with them, bringing them along because the Lord is at hand. The Lord is, his second coming is near. It's been mentioned several times. We just read it in chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, is coming back. Or we go back to earlier when it says, in a, it's on the first page of notes, chapter 1, verse 28, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. So when they oppose, he, in chapter 1, verse 28, on the first page of the notes or in your Bibles, you can read it, Paul's almost telling them the same thing in chapter 1. When they're opposing you, when they're causing trouble in your life, you are not frightened by them. The word that's coming up here in our text night is anxiety. You don't get bent out of shape because you, you rejoice because you're in the Lord. You see the big picture. And by you staying calm, not being frightened, and in our case here, you continue to be gentle or compassionate or gracious, not having uh, a retaliation right here. It says without being frightened, we could add to that, without being anxious, without retaliating, but continuing to be gracious uh, to those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed. In other words, one way of showing them your understanding in the Lord is to be patient, meaning I'm not planning on winning here. I'm not going to win the world. I'm not going to win this game. Our game is coming at the end. So I'm going to continue to be gracious. I'm going to continue to be Christ-like because Jesus Christ is coming back. And when he comes back, I will be justified and the world will be brought to ruin. The real world will be judged. And so... If you look at this in two ways, our gentleness should be evident to all because the Lord is near. That's what he's doing currently in the universe or in the world is he's near and he's being gracious. Or it can mean you continue to be gracious because the Lord's coming is at hand. And when he comes, he'll take care of the retaliation. He'll take care. Well, it says that right in chapter 1, verse 28, that you'll be delivered, but they will be destroyed. So, um... You can make a decision. I got some of those notes written there at the top of page three, uh, which is your second page. It's just number three. Um, so they're rejoicing in the face of opposition. So let's go back to the text, chapter four, verse four. Rejoice in the Lord, Lord always, meaning you're rejoicing 
in the Lord with your understanding of this information, and you're doing it always because it's not changing. The information has not changed. Everything is still true, and you're rejoicing in the Lord, and you're doing it always. I say it again, or in other words, this is important. Rejoice. I mean, you think of someone that, again, we mentioned football. Think of the coach at halftime, or, you know, I always think of basketball. But it's like we've got to start rebounding because that's how we get possession of the ball and keep the other team from scoring. I say it again, we've got to rebound. And so here it is. He's saying the same thing. Rejoice in the Lord. You've got to understand the truth and rejoice in that truth, and you do it always. I'm telling you again, this is key. You've got to be rejoicing. And again, what's sad about that is the shallow Christian will just say, well, that means be happy and smile all the time. I'm not going to complain. It's like, why aren't you complaining? Well, because I want to be a Christian. It's like, do you know anything? Well, we're, I don't want to be negative. I want to have a positive attitude. Well, you're not even close. You're just being socially acceptable now. This is rejoicing in the Lord, understanding that he's coming back to set up his kingdom and destroy this world, and you're going to continue to be graceful. Well, let's read the next verse. Let your gentleness be evident to all, because you're rejoicing. That can kind of come across as, what, what's... This whole world's falling apart and you're rejoicing. Well, because I know where this is headed. Everything's going to work out for me because I know the Lord. So let your gentleness, your non-judgmental attitude, be evident to all that's your job. You're not the judge. You're the one that's rejoicing because the judge is coming. Because the Lord is near. And that either means he's near with you now, not judging the world, or it means his coming is near. So you're rejoicing, you're being gentle all because judgment's very near. Okay, now verse 6, we begin a series here, a series of, of thoughts that just build on itself. And, right, and it still goes in line with this. It says, do not be anxious about anything. And I think that supports kind of where I'm going with this or how I'm building. They're rejoicing in the Lord because the world is bringing opposition. They're being gentle or gracious to the world because the world doesn't understand them. And now do not be anxious about anything. Angel boy. I always spell anxious wrong. There's, there's an exit that throws me off. Okay. Do not be anxious about anything, which means there are things for them to be anxious about. They are facing opposition. They are facing struggles. The world is against them. They, because of that, there's disunity in their church because they begin slipping into thinking like the world. So their church is now in, imploding on itself. So Paul's trying to get them to have be like-minded, think about Christ, and the world's opposition is still going to be there, but if you're united, like-minded, rejoicing, you'll be able to testify to the world. Otherwise, your testimony is going to be destroyed. So, do not be anxious about anything. And again, anything means anything, but I would say in context here, it would refer again to the world that's coming against them. If it's opposition, if it's the struggles, if it's the climate of this age, don't be anxious about this age. Watch this. But in everything... And it has a list, prayer, petition, thanksgiving, prayer, petition, thanksgiving. Now, if I was truly a Christian pastor, speaker, I would then springboard on this word right here, and we'd call this the thanksgiving message. But we're not going to do that, but there it is if you want it. Prayer, petition, thanksgiving and request. So, you do not be anxious, but instead of being anxious, say this, this is the fire. Instead of being burnt by the fire, here is the water. When you, He's not saying don't be anxious. You shouldn't be anxious because you shouldn't have any trouble. Read Paul in 2 Corinthians. He had all kinds of trouble. He talked about sleepless nights. He talked about continually worrying about the church. He's constantly got these things that he's concerned about. And so he was facing anxiousness or fire. But what did Paul do with the fire? He went here with it. He brought water on it. Not to get necessarily get rid of the source, get rid of the, you know, the, what was causing this problem. You can't get rid of the world. But get rid of this. Keep that we're, we're heading here. Keep this out of your soul. Keep this out of your mind, which is going to end up meaning thoughts. It's, it's coming. I mean, the, the, this is where this is heading. This, he's not saying, and get rid of all of your problems. Pray so all your problems go away so you can be happy again. No, because you're supposed to rejoice always in the Lord. 
in, in spite of what's going on. But instead of being anxious, when you are anxious or when you face these things, bring it with prayer, petitions, with thanksgiving, and make requests. And so this is interesting because right here is a little, little breakdown of what prayer looks like for Paul. It's not this hypnotic state of just, you know, everything's going to be fine, but it actually includes requests. For example, what's making you anxious? Well, these are the things that are making me anxious, and this is how I would like them resolved. Bring these to God with thanksgiving, prayer and petition. You bring them to God. Once again, knowing, and that's part of this thanksgiving, knowing that he's near, he's listening, you're important, and he's going to deal with your request, he's, and he's going to do exactly what you asked him to do. It's like he's the big Santa Claus in the sky. No, you're taking this world and you're bringing it to the Lord who's got the plan and you're going to be able to take, again, it's going to come to your understanding of what God is doing, knowing that you can bring it to him and he is going to make it work out. Let's go back and look at, I'm going to read this again and we're going to look at these words. Verse 6, chapter 4, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. That's imperative, that's a command. But it doesn't say there's nothing to be anxious about. It says don't be anxious about it. When you have something to be anxious about, bring some water or but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving so you're going to do it with prayer petition while you're giving thanks and what's that thanks on us it's not a manipulative term for god it's like oh i just want to thank you god that you're so good so will you do this for me if i butter god up a little bit he'll do something nice for me i say something nice to god he does something nice for me no you're going to go with prayer and petition with the attitude of thanksgiving, knowing that when I come to God, it's the same reason you're rejoicing. You're rejoicing in the Lord because you know how the game is going to end. You know you're going to win. So you're rejoicing the whole time, even in the midst of the trouble. And when you go to him with prayer and petition, you're coming with thanksgiving, knowing he's listening, knowing he's hearing, knowing he's going to work this out. You present your request to God. Now, I'm going to rush on into this next verse because the next word in the NIV, and I think it's probably in every translation, it's in the Greek, the word and, I don't want to rush into this too far, but the word and, it's chi in the Greek right there, it's a connecting word, meaning if you are anxious, you put that fire out with prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, presenting your request to God, and then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will, notice this, guard your hearts, and your minds in Christ Jesus. You are anxious, I'm rushing ahead, you're anxious in your heart. In Proverbs and in Jesus' teaching, the heart is the wellspring of life. In some circles, people try to break down the heart and the mind, and how are these things different, the souls, one's the spirit, one's the soul. You can knock yourself out trying to define that if you want to. But basically, the heart is the wellspring of life. It's where the waters of life come from. If the heart is good, everything is good. Uh, Proverbs tells the youth, guard your heart because it's where your wellspring of life comes from. If your heart, it gets, it gets messed up. If it becomes toxic, you're no longer pumping fresh water through your being. You're pumping toxic waste through your being. Or your mind, which is your thoughts, is the things that you're thinking about. It all ties back into anxious. Instead of being anxious in your soul and pumping toxic water through your soul, or instead of being anxious and having anxious thoughts and thinking about all the things that can go wrong and always being worried, you're going to take your soul, your heart, and your mind, and you're going to stop the toxic waste, you're going to stop the polluted thoughts, and you're going to get rid of this because of prayer, petition, thanksgiving, and request. The peace of God is going to come. Where's the peace of God comes from? It comes from this prayer, petitions, thanksgiving, and request because you've gone to God knowing He's hearing you, that He's responding. He's going to send you the peace of God, and that peace of God is going to come from your soul or your heart, come from your thoughts. You might, again, the thoughts are the things, the knowledge that you've put in there because of the Word of God. Your heart, your soul, that's the wellspring of life. If it includes the new birth, it includes the Spirit of God, it includes the washing of the water of the Word. This is now pumping fresh water through your soul. It's now going to guard your heart and your, your thoughts in Christ Jesus. So let's go back and look at these words. I mean, this is, this, is, this is crucial. I mean, this is important. And it comes down to, once again, it comes down to knowing something. 
It comes down to knowing what God is doing, revealed in his word. It comes down to knowing that I'm going to face opposition when I do. Stay calm. Pray about it. Bring, it. bring those requests to God because he knows about it. And he'll begin to work. And you know he's working in your life. The problem's not necessarily going to go away. But you're going to have an understanding through the knowledge. And he's talking about this peace of God. Verse 7, if there's anything mystical or magical in here, it's right here when it says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. And I'm rushing through this. We'll look at this word. Transcends is a word that is, is well, it, it means super. It means above and beyond. It transcends. And it can mean, it can read it one of two ways. It is above and beyond. We'll come back and look at this. It means above and beyond what you already have. So it means it transcends all of the thoughts and schemes and plans you can come up with. God's going to come up with a better one. Or it means it transcends. It's not even of the same arena. You've got this world of thoughts. You've got this world that you're living in. But the peace of God is going to go, it's not going to be greater than that. It's going to be, it's going to set that aside and say, here's something completely different. It's like, oh, this doesn't even matter anymore. So if anything's mystical, magical here, as far as something happening that's supernatural, it's not that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it's, it's better than anything you can think of. It means something else is going to come, and you're going to experience something that's going to set these things aside because you're going to have the, the peace of God. What, it's, it, again, does that include a greater understanding? Now, Understanding God's word is part of this. Understanding God's revelation is part of it. But this peace of God may involve something that's uh, uh, above that. It's, it's something that, well, it's beyond understanding. It transcends all understanding. So I'm up here trying to explain the verse that means it transcends all understanding, which means it's, I'm having a hard time explaining it. Uh, uh, I think I'm having a hard time because it transcends understanding. I can't explain it. So again, I'll go back and look at these words and clear this up a little bit. But we got several things happening here. Let's look on uh, page 3, uh, Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, it says in the English version, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Again, notice request. You're going to God with requests. And these requests are based on the fact that you are anxious about certain things. You're not in some kind of self-denial. You're not working yourself in some kind of hypnotic state. You are anxious about this. I am concerned about this. Paul was concerned about this church. He was concerned about this group of people. And what did he do with them? He went to God with requests. He even at one time asked God, can you take this away from me? And God says, no. He said three times, no, no, no. It's good for that to be there because my grace is made Made, or, or, or your, uh, my grace is made perfect in weakness. In other words, you're going to experience, is he talking about that peace of God? As long as you've got this here and this here causing opposition to you, you're going to have to go to a place that is beyond understanding again. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, because of that, I'll always rejoice in my weakness. And when I'm having these oppositions, he says, I've learned the secret. It's like God's grace is greater than anything else. Not just in salvation, but in all of this. Well, nonetheless. Uh, Galen, would, would you mind, uh, okay, the word petition, and, and in my Bible it says supplication. Yep. Somehow supplication seems more clear to me, but petition, can you Yep, explain? I can do it. If you look at your notes uh, is, about, on page three, you can see the last bullet point on page three where it says anxiety can be confronted in the believer's soul with... And there's a bullet point, oh. prayer, and there's your Greek word. And again, you can follow that word prayer up into the Greek text there and find, again, even the Greek word in the Strong's number. But it, that generally means prayer is a general word for prayer. You're going to God in prayer. Now, your word supplication is the word D-E-E-S-I-S, -E -E desis, refers to the person's sense of need. Okay. And so that, again, that's that anxiety and they're, you're actually realizing, I have a sense of need, and, and you're going... Sometimes that, that word can be used for even man-to-man -man or person-to-person. -person. The, the, text, the Greek text was saying, if you have a need, you go to a person, I've got this need, please help me with this. Uh, I'm having a hard time moving this object. That's different than request. 
petition, see, for me, when you say petition, it sounds like the same request. But oh, it's not. well, yeah, okay. They're if, not the same. If you look down there, hopefully I've got that. Did I even put request? Yeah, there's request. That's the next word. Making our requests known to God. Request is, you see, the word in the Greek is a temata, mm -hmm. is a, the specific content of a formulated and precise petition. Okay. So, again, there's a, there, that word request, again, is something that you've, you've thought through it. it uh, Nehemiah. When Nehemiah is standing in front of the king in, in Persia, and he says, what's troubling you? Uh, and he says, well, Jerusalem, the walls are, they're not, they're, there's no walls there. And he says, well, what would you like to do? And all of a sudden, Nehemiah is like, uh, well, you know, I don't know. If you just help. It's like, well, now that you ask, he's got a formulated, what's interesting about Nehemiah is we, the king says, what, what would you like me to do about it? He says, boom, boom, boom. He's got the list. He's got it. He's a, it's a classic case of the specific content of a formulated and precise petition. And the king says, okay, here, I'll sign it right here. Go pick up the material. I'll send it over to you. Get some men together and get back there and get it done. So that is an example of when it says the Greek meaning of the word, we're looking at English words, request. But here, the word means a request is something that you've thought through. This is what I would like God to do in this situation. Now, God's not going to jump through hoops for you, but you know in your own prayer, I know this, you know this. If you've spent time praying about something, especially something that God is in God's will, think about your children, think about your your work environment, think about where you say, this is what I want. I want this for my children. I want this in my work environment. And you pray about it, you stay consistent in it. I have seen, and you have too, where these things start to line up. God is lining things up with, just like the king did for uh, uh, Nehemiah. It's like, what do you want? Well, I want boom, boom, boom. And it's like, here you go. Again, be careful with what I'm saying. I'm not saying God's a genie. But when it tells you, you go to God, you've got, you're anxious about things in life with requests. You have, do you, what do you want? Oh, God, I just, you know, I'm just miserable. Please help me, help me. I mean, that's not a bad start. But it's like, now, how, what do you have in mind? And somebody's like, well, I don't know. And that's, that's fair, too. But sometimes you know what you want for your children. Or sometimes you know what you want at work. Sometimes you know you've got a relationship with a person and something's gone wrong. I want this relationship restored. I want this. And things begin because you brought this request to God. This is what this is saying. Prayer is a general term. Petition is something where you can go to and, and, and refers to a person has a sense of need. I want something done. And so requests could be the specific list or you know the organized petition. With prayer and petitions in thanksgiving, make your request known to God. So you're going to take, if I could break this down again, and don't, don't let me answer your question if I haven't answered your question. I don't, you know, go yeah. ahead and follow that up with a question. This request <laughs> is... The list, this is what I want, and I'm coming up in petitioning, asking, I need help in this situation. Here's what I want done. I'm coming to God in prayer. This is what I want done. And I'm coming with an attitude of thanksgiving, knowing that just like the re I'm rejoicing always in the Lord because it's always the same. God is the same. And you're always coming in thanksgiving because it's not like I hope he hears me. I wonder if he's going to hear me. Yeah, he's hearing you. And you're coming with, but pray, in prayer and petition with a request, this is what I want in this situation that's making me anxious. So instead of being anxious and getting burned by the fire, you bring water, and that water is going to be prayer and petitions in the form of an organized request being come along with thanksgiving, knowing I know the fire. Call not, I mean, we, somebody, we have more confidence in 911 than we do in this. And if you're going to call 911, well, not, you call 911, you're thanking 911 for it's like, I'm going to call 911. I've never called 911, but I assume it works. Um, I'm using an illustration. But it's like you're dialing 911. It's, I can remember it. I can remember it. I have the building code because 911 is easy and it's three digits. Our building code at school is four digits. About once a week, they change it like twice a year. This last week, I had a stop, I've got it written down. In my billfold right here, I've got it written down. Well, I've got everything written down. I can't lose this piece of paper. See this? This is everything right here. 
and this is way off subject, you don't even care. Passwords, it's got my, I shouldn't even show this on video, but uh, it's got everything on here, including the school building code, because I had, I walked up, and I looked at it, it's like, I've done it like for six weeks in a row, it's like, I had to get this out and look at it. It's, it's four digits, it's too much for me to remember. So when I called 911, the whole reason for saying all that was, when you know, I call 911, I'm thankful because I can remember the digits. It's like it's only three digits. But anyway. Galen, yes, you know something, when you call 911, they also want your request. Right. They will say, what's your emergency? You better tell them what's your emergency. Right. Okay. Is the person conscious? They're going to ask you. So they want your request to be made clear, right. even 911. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that may be, might be a, well, if you want to do a devotion, take that and develop that into a daily <laughs> devotion. But yeah, exactly. It's so, interesting. And those, yes, it, exactly. And so these words right here, prayer is a general word for prayer. Supplication refers to a person's sense of need, and you're making supplication. It even means to another person, I need help with this. And then request is a specific content of a formulated or precise petition that you're bringing up and, and making your prayer. And then, of course, it's with thanksgiving. Now, let's read through the text, and I'm reading through the NIV in my Bible. Do not be anxious about anything. You should not, if you're anxious about something, here's what you do. Instead, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request, your thought out plans to God. I am anxious about this. I'm going to come to God in prayer and supplication. I'm, I'm going to God in prayer, fellowshipping with God. I'm bringing a petition. I'm bringing something that I, I need. I'm coming to him in a time of need, and here's what I want, and you're coming with an attitude of thankfulness. Now, if you can do that, again, and the only reason you would do that is if you had an understanding. Again, we go back to having some kind of knowledge. You can't rejoice in the Lord if you don't know anything about the Lord. You can rejoice because you got free ice cream, but you're not rejoicing in the Lord, you're rejoicing in ice cream. If you have knowledge of the Lord, you can rejoice in the midst of having no ice cream. You can rejoice in the Lord because you've got knowledge of the Lord. The same thing, if you're going to have a time of being anxious or problems in your life, if you have information, you're going to be able to come to God with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, knowing this knowledge that he's hearing you and make your request. Give him your list and you can go to him and instead of being anxious, you can leave it there saying, okay, he's heard this and I do like this. This is my own personal con conviction. Uh, I like repetition in prayer. Now I'm not saying about saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, but I don't, my personal conviction is I don't think, I know I'm not impressed because I've done it many times with myself, when I pray for something once and then I never think about it again. Some people call that a great act of faith. I call that not very sincere. Um, for example, I coached basketball for years and I didn't teach rebounding one time or I teach shop. I don't teach something one time and say, well, I've got that covered. But if it's important enough like rebounding or I can think of examples in the shop Oh, I could give you so many examples. Of I, I've got 20 kids in the shop, and I'm giving them this, the, these 12 pieces of wood. And I make a point. You have 12 pieces of wood. I've got them taped together. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm serious. Look, count them. When class is over, wherever you're at, write your name on those pieces, tape them together, and put them in your locker. I'm telling you, how many do you have? You've got 12. How many do you have? 12. Now, tomorrow when you come in, you're going to come up to me and say, oh, Mr. Weimers, I only got 11. It's like, no, you didn't. And I'm going to tell you boldly, no, you're wrong. You got 12 because I cut them, I taped them, you counted them. We're all agreeing, you've got 12 pieces. And I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm making a big deal about this until the project is complete because you've got 20 kids every hour for six hours. That's 120 kids coming in. And if two kids every hour loses two pieces of wood, you understand what kind of chaos you're going to have the next day. It's like you spend all hour running around trying to find those four pieces of wood. It's like, well, they stole mine. They've got, well, I've got 13. How do I get 13? <laughs> well, I, let me see if I can take a guess. And so I make a point. This is important. This is important, like rebounding in basketball. We're not just going to re work on rebounding the first practice. We're going to work on rebounding every night of practice because, and the same thing, I think the same thing is true with prayer. I don't like it when I pray about something once and walk away. 
I like to pray about things repeatedly, like every night. If it's important enough to me, you name, say one of my kids or my grandson or something like this, I like to pray about it tonight. And then when I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning tomorrow night, it's like I'll pray about it again. And I keep making my requests known to God. And some of you say, well, that's not an act of faith. Well, it's right here. I'm anxious about it. And by prayer and petition, I'm going, well, I've already prayed about it. Well, I'm thanking him for it, but I'm mentioning it. This is still something I'm looking for. I want this done in my life. And I like that idea of repetitive prayer. Now, I know Jesus says, you don't be like the heathen that just babble on and on and on, say the same over and over again. Well, I think a lot of that is just mindlessly praying and saying nothing. I don't think that's what this is talking about. Anyway, that's my own personal conviction, and that's not in the text. That's just free. It uh, comes along with knowing that I don't know the building code all the time. Okay, let's go back to the text and get through this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, because you've got knowledge that God is listening, present your request, an organized, thought-through plan to God. And because of that, and that's what this and means, and this is the result of doing that. Meaning if you do not do that, if you do not understand that, if you don't have the knowledge to be able to pray with that kind of confidence, you're not going to get number seven. You've got to be able to do chapter or verse six in a biblical manner. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But if you can't, now remember, if you're anxious, but you're going to go to God in prayer, and I'm going to use the word right here on the side, you've got some kind of knowledge, some kind of understanding, some kind of truth that you're confident when you get done praying, you know something happened. You're going to have the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, and we'll talk about what that means, or at least give some options, and that peace of God is going to do what? It's going to guard, it's going to guard, and that means like a, a garrison. It's a military term. It means we are guarding this fortress. This fortress is ours. You're not coming in here. The peace of God will guard two things. It will guard your heart. It will guard your mind. And the word mind does not, the word here does not, it's, it's, it's a form I can show you right here in the bottom of page four. The word, it's not the word mind. It means the active part of the mind. It means better will guard your Thoughts. Now again, that's not a great difference, but the difference is there. Your thoughts that are coming out of your, your mind is guarded so that the thoughts that it's producing are not anxious. It's protecting your mind because the thoughts that will filter through your mind are going to be filtered through this knowledge, the Word of God, that bring in peace in your life. And the thoughts are going to be filtered through the cleansing Word of God. It's going to protect, it will guard this peace of God will guard your heart, where the wellsprings of life come from, and what thoughts are coming out of your head. It won't be toxic waste going through the wellsprings, saying, oh, I'm so anxious, and it won't be thoughts of disaster and trouble and stuff. It's going to be thoughts that are filtered through the Word of God. It's going to guard your heart and your thoughts. And here it says, it says again, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So again, you're anxious, you're going to pray making your request known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God will be the result of that. And that peace of God, when you get it, transcends all understanding, whatever that means. It will guard your heart and your thoughts. The very place, where do you get anxious at? You don't get anxious in your right arm. My right arm is anxious. Yeah, look at my right arm. It looks really anxious today. You get anxious in your heart and your thoughts. So when you're anxious prayer, the peace of God comes, that peace guards your heart and thoughts from becoming anxious. You still have the same problem. You're still going through the opposition. You're still going through struggles, but you're not going to be anxious. You've got God working on your side, actively doing something, but it also you know that God is aware and involved in it, and it's going to guard your hearts. And, uh, your hearts. and this is Paul, Paul talking right here. Now let's go back and look at a few things. Let's turn to page four, and I'm about done here. Uh, on page four, you see the Greek there at the top. But again, first bullet point, note this verse begins with and or chi. And that, that's a connecting word. That's not just an extra and. That's a connecting word, meaning because of this, this is going to be the result. Paul used it deliberately to collect, connect prayer with peace. 
to contrast prayer with anxiety. So you've got a choice. Stay anxious or pray. If you stay anxious, you're going to have anxiety. If you pray, the peace of God will come and it will guard your heart and mind or thoughts from becoming anxious. Okay? Paul had earlier written the Colossians, a similar verse. I don't have, there it is right here. Colossians 3 verse 15. Now remember, Colossians has already been written when Philippians is written. It's already been sent over to Asia Minor, and then Philippians is going to be written and sent up to Macedonia. So this, is, this verse has already been written, and the Colossians have already read it. Here it is, chapter 3, verse 15. It's in your notes. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. So you, you can work on that, but here, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. If you let this peace of Christ now, now it's saying you let it rule. Let it rule. It's available, but you're going to have to let it be there. You can get rid of this by not praying, by not having any knowledge, and you can't let it rule. But if you've got the knowledge and the ability to pray, you can let this peace rule, and it will guard, he just says, your hearts in Christ Jesus. That's when he writes the Colossians. The natural result of a confident prayer is peace, which is from the Greek word arene. Oh, shoot, I don't have time to do this. Chapter 26, verse 3. Man, I am going to do it. And I, I, go to chapter 26, verse 3. No, you don't need to. I've got it written there. And again, you know this verse. You've seen it on bumper stickers or something. <laughs> chapter Isaiah 26, verse 3. You keep him in perfect peace, and that perfect peace in the Hebrew is peace, peace, which is, you know, it's, it's like the extreme form of, it's like uh, dying thou shalt die in Genesis, though it is dying, dying. And it's like dying you're going to die. It's death, death. This is peace, peace, which means perfect peace. It translates in English, perfect peace. You will keep him, you keep him in perfect peace, who's, notice this, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Notice the word mind and the word trust. There's got to be something in the mind. If you have a vacuum in your mind and all you know is, well, I think Jesus loves everybody. It's like, okay, you're not going here. You're going to have to know something is in your mind, and their mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You've got information. Um, the Hebrew word for mind is yetzer, which means thoughts, which is interesting because that's where I'm going with this right here. The mind in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, is, it's the word thoughts. Hebrew the same way. Yetzer means thoughts and refers to these things. It does refer to the organ, the mind. It refers to the frame of mind, the mindset, the world view. What are you thinking? If you have your mind, and again, stayed on you, I mean, you can go, I just think about Jesus all the time. It's like, okay, that's, that's clever. But this is Jesus. The, you need to know is that Jesus is not just a magical word. This is, the, this is how he created it. This is what he's got planned to do. This is what he's done as far as salvation. This is his plan for the church and what you're supposed to be doing. And this is how he's coming back. Is your mind on this? Well, I don't think we need to know this. I think we just need to love the Lord. Who is the Lord? Well, you know, it's, it's, he's different for everybody. Okay, you're in trouble. This is the Lord and whose mind is stayed on him. You will have peace. Whose mind is stayed on him. It says, who trusts in him. So that, that's, again, I could go off on that. The, the word transcends. You can see right there, I've got it written out. It's the next bullet point. Transcends is from hyperacusa. Hyper means above and beyond. That's your typical, we see that in many Greek words, not many, but a lot of combination words. And then exo basically means to have. Together the word hyper hyperacusa means to have beyond, to be superior, to surpass. I don't have time to develop this like I would like to. This could mean two things. The peace of God which will achieve more than all of our clever forethought or ingenious plans could have. In other words, man is, it could mean this. And again, I've already referred to this. And I'd like to develop it some more. It could mean man's thoughts reach this level. But the peace of God transcends all understanding. It means God's thoughts are up here. Again, Isaiah says that my ways are higher than your ways. And there's a comparison. That could be it. Meaning this is the best you can do. But with the peace of God, God's getting this right here. You're going to get a higher, it's almost the same thing. It's just super of what man can do. The other idea would be the next one. The peace of God transcends every human thought, which means it is beyond our understanding. It is not an upgrade to human thought because it is not even the same thing. It is impossible to compare the peace of God with anything. In other words, this is man's thoughts right here. This is what he can do. 
but God's, when the peace of God is, makes this irrelevant because it's not even on the chart. It's like man's thoughts don't even matter. And that would be equivalent to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And there's that word right here. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 18, we can develop that because in chapter 3, verse 18, a similar form of the word is used. And in that case right there, it means surpassing greatness, excellency, meaning it's a uniqueness, not superior. The first one is it's superior. This second idea, it's unique. You're doing this, but God's peace is unique. It's not even, it's not even on the same page. So again, that's what that could mean. Guard, the word guard, there's your military metaphor for a garrison or those who guard and protect. And I've got that written down there about the heart and the mind. And then the very last bullet point, so you understand where I got the idea of mind, meaning thoughts, is the word ta no amata. It is not the word mind, which is nos. Uh, but denotes the concrete uh, it, it denotes the concrete activity of the mind or the thoughts. It's not talking about the mind, obviously. It's not, going to, it's not a helmet that's going to protect your mind. It's a, it's a force that's going to protect the thoughts, the product, productivity of your mind. So there's those verses right there. We'll review that next week. And then Paul says in verse 8, Finally, brothers, so we're talking about the mind, the thoughts of the mind. So what are you going to put in your mind? Finally, whatever's true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. So instead of anxious thoughts, the peace of God will come on. And they, here's kind of what you should be thinking on. This is the things that should start coming in your mind are those lists right there. The noble, the, the lovely, the pure, the, and that we'll talk about that. So he's talking again about setting the stage for Christian maturity for these Philippians who are in a church that's dividing because they're starting to think like the world. They're starting to pit against each other. And he wants them to be like-minded, always in the book, be like-minded, have the same thoughts as Christ, same thoughts as each other. And now he's giving them the illustration. And this, if you're anxious, the reason you're going to the world, because you're anxious, you're not praying, you don't have any knowledge. You get some knowledge, you'll pray, you know that God, you'll have faith, you'll come together, you can be like-minded, and now you think these thoughts, and those th the peace of God is going to protect your, your wellspring of life, is going to protect your thoughts, and then great things will happen, because now you'll be productive. Okay, well, I'll pray, and you're free to go. I appreciate you taking time to be here. Father, we do thank you again for your truth. We thank you for your word. We do ask that we can understand these things, that the things we've talked about tonight, that the Spirit of God would bring to life, it would help polish them up, iron them out, make them clear, make them applicable to our own lives, that we could be productive citizens of your kingdom at this time in history here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for your time.